Ken Sanders from Ken Sanders Rare Books in Salt Lake City. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Bob, it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Now, you are not just the owner of a rare bookstore, but you are truly one of the leading experts on rare books in this country. Really? Yes, you are. How did you get interested in rare books? How did you get attracted to that? Um, I don't recall a time that I didn't love books. I, I've just always read them. My mother, my late mother, claims I was born reading a book. With a rare book in your hand. That probably is an exaggeration. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I mean, I was there, but I don't remember. Uh, I just, I always read vor voraciously as a child, anything I could get my hands on that I liked. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 13, 14 years old, I was a pretty serious book collector. I was really attracted to the artwork, like in the Oz books and Alice in Wonderland and things like that as a child, fascinated by Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. When I was 14 years old, I bought a huge folio edition of The Raven with full page engravings oh, wow. of, of each quatrain of the poem by Gustave Doré. Do you still have it? No, not that copy, oh. no. That's a long, sad story. <laughs> A long, sad tale, like this, this, the mouse's tail in, in Alice that's printed typographically in the shape of a mouse's mm, tail. My word. And I just, I just always, always love books and their illustrators. The artwork's very important to me. Over the past 20 years, as we have come into the digital age, there, were, there have been people who are concerned that hardbound books would become obsolete and that we would just be reading things off of screens and that kind of thing. What have you observed? Uh, I say bunny fuzz. Bunny fuzz. Bunny fuzz. It, it's a bunch of nonsense and malarkey. Look. The, the great lost library at Alexandria, monks sitting on stools, much like the ones we're sitting on right now, writing scrawls on animal skins and papyrus. Book bibliophiles, book lovers, have never been at the mainstream or the forefront of anything. Yeah, once in a while, particularly in the modern age, books get made into movies that become pop culture phenomenon, you know, Harry Potter, what have you. But for the large part, us book people, we live in this far distant corner of the universe and are usually by ourselves reading. So <laughs> we're not going anywhere. There's no, if anything, there's more of us now. The, the, the digital revolution, whatever you want to call it, the internet, all of that, I don't pretend to know it or understand it. Uh, I, it doesn't bother me. I, I think the more ways people can access information, the better, although I think with all this nonsense that's going on in the public debate and the instantaneousness of people being able to just real-time interact with the other, maybe it really is the decline and fall of our civilization. Mm. It's, it, it doesn't seem to be healthy right now. The discourse isn't healthy. So other than that, great, more. If you want to read on a screen on the airplane, more power to you. I, I choose not to do that. But those of us that are true bibliophiles, we want that physical book. Even young kids every single day someone comes in my bookshop and says i love the smell of this place mm. what they're referring to is old books and paper decaying and rotting right under their noses you are obviously very excited about rare books why are you so excited about something that many people go oh rare books how well, did you how why are you so excited <laughs> well most people i mean most people don't know what a rare book is bob uh, i often jokingly well because they they, they want to sell me a book oh well i got i got a declaration of independence i got a gone with the wind first edition i got a blah 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 i got a kill a mockingbird what have you well first of all no they don't <laughs> and even without seeing it how do you know because I've done this for so long. The yeah. chances of them, the, 
the first issue of the Deseret News, to pick a local example. 1850, one of the earliest territorial newspapers produced out anywhere in the West outside of San Francisco. Mm. They printed fewer than 300 copies. Those pa papers are made out of 100% cotton rags. Oh there was my. no such thing as wood pulp tree paper. And Cotton a, rags? Yes. If you look in the early issues of the Des News, it calls for rags, rags. They couldn't print because they couldn't get enough cloth to turn into paper to print. Oh, my word. It's so-called, not really paper, but it's a form of paper. It, there were less, there's, I've only handled two authentic ones in 50 years in this business. Oh, wow. They're do you, that do you still have them? Of course not. Oh. I'm, I buy and sell things. I live <laughs> vicariously through, the, through, it's the thrill of the hunt, Bob. Where do your rare books come from? Um, okay, f back to your earlier question. What is a rare book? I facetiously tell people a rare book, by my definition, is one that I have and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> because you think you've got the desert news. You think you've got the first edition to kill a mockingbird, to grapes of wrath, of mice and men, yeah. of gone with the wind, but you don't. And even if you do, it's going to be in terrible condition and it won't have its dust jack or the jacket. It won't have the paper wrapper that goes around it. Yeah. That's where the value is, not in the book. Oh, really? So where do they come from? Where do you get them from? They find me. How so? Give well, me an example. I've gotten old Describe and lazy. Describe it to me. What, three times this morning as after we opened the shop, the first three people in the store were all after me to, to sell books. I didn't... Well, I, I did, I bought a handful of books on the uh, Navajo language. Uh, I turned down a, a pretty Shakespeare, but worthless. And then the others was an estate and they needed to, uh, uh, they're just trying to figure out if they had anything valuable and they just brought in some samples and mm -hmm. it, they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I travel the country doing book fairs. Uh, I buy quite heavily at those, but honestly, and I do go out on house calls reluctantly, but most of the books, literally, they, they do find me. They walk in the door every hour of the day. Some people might say I have somewhat of a problem, but I'm not a hoarder, Bob. Come on. I'm, I'm selling these things. Or I'm okay. pretending to sell, to sell them huh? someday. So the bookstore is 4,000 square feet. Yeah. Now, in 21 years... I, I hate to think of the quantity and the mass and the physics of what I've stuffed into that store. And I'm here to tell you, it's way easier to buy a book than to sell one. Yeah, I'll bet. Someday, the physics of the place, if I <laughs> last that long, gonna catch up with I'm, I'm going to show up one day and there's going to be this smoking hole in the <laughs> ground where everything's <laughs> collapsed like the fall of the House of Usher. What is it you look for in a rare book? That, go, that makes you go, ah, this is a rare find. Well, the single most important thing is condition. If you've got a book that's worth $10,000, doesn't matter what it's worth, and it's not in very good or better condition, you, you can't get $100 for it. Nobody wants it. Mm. And that's the hardest thing for either a would-be collector or even dealers. They, oh, my gosh, this is a rare book. It's not, because the condition. And if you just think about it, however many were printed, they're clearer, few, they're fewer today than there used to be through attrition, fires, who knows. So it should be rarer, but how many of them are still in as new or very fine condition? And that's gonna be five or 10%. Mm. And that's what the collector wants. And back to the dust jacket remark, a modern 20th century first edition the value, 90% of the value is in the paper wrapper, 10% in the book, because 90% of the books don't have their dust jackets anymore. Mm -hmm. On your website, uh, there are the various categories of rare books that you have, and I went through and, and it listed the number of rare books that you have. Oh, it does. By far, I didn't even know that. Yeah, well, <laughs> by far, the largest number of rare books that you have fall under the LDS culture. Utah and the Mormons. Yeah, that's exactly right. Number one, why is that? And number two, 
have rare LDS books increased in value or decreased in value over time? Um, <clears throat> one would have to be a doggone fool not to deal in material with the LDS religion and what I call Utah and the Mormons. We're not here to proselytize for or against. We carry the good, the bad, the ugly. We carry the common, the rare, the collectible. And as far as what in the instance of rare LDS books and their relatively relative market, back in the 1970s when I created the Cosmic Aeroplane Bookstore in downtown Salt Lake, my first commercial endeavor, mm -hmm. uh, still legendary place with old timers. Um, I issued my first LDS book catalog, rare book catalog, and I acquired my very first 1830 Book of Mormon. First edition. Wow. I sold it for the then record price of $5,000. Oh, my word. The last copy we sold, nice condition now, mm -hmm. remember? Condition, mm -hmm. condition, condition, condition. Yes. $95,000. Oh, my word. Why did it increase in value so much? It's not a rare book, Bob. You want one? You, you got a hundred grand you want to spend on one? I can make, I don't have one. I'll make a phone call. I'll have one here in 24 hours for you. It's not a rare book. That's not a definition. A rare book. Well, my, why is it so expensive? A hundred thousand dollars for a book Because like that. it's highly sought after. You have a growing, uh, increasingly affluent LDS population, and they may not even be, rarely are they traditional book collectors, mm. but they want an artifact of their religion. And the 1830 first edition Book of Mormon is the holy grail for Mormon book collectors. Wow. And that's the one, everyone knows that what that is. If we talk about an obscure hymnal or other rarities, uh, like the rarest Book of Mormon, it's the Hawaiian one, but nobody cares about that because it's well, unless Do you, you have it? No. I've, I've handled two in 50 years. It's in that good rare. condition? Yes. $100,000 book. Holy. It's, there's only 300 of them. There's 3,000 1830 Book of Mormons still out there. It's a 5,000 copy print run. Rarity and scarcity are related. They're not the same thing. Mm. A rare book is a book that just because you want it, you desire it, and you've got the wherewithal whether it's 10,000, 100,000, or millions, you've got the wherewithal to acquire it. You can't have it until a copy manifests itself in the marketplace. Wow. That's what a rare book is. Do you wind up reading each of the rare books that you get your hands on? We collate them, not read them. We have to examine every single page so our customer knows it's right, that there's not a page, page missing. missing, torn, stained, and increasingly in this digital age, you can, I don't know, technically you could, with enough resources, fabricate an entire rare book, but a single page, like a title page to a book, mm. that's a piece of cake, and, and the technology is so good now, it's increasingly difficult to detect it. Oh, my. And it's How often do you get that kind of a, a fake we, book into your Well, bookstore? we don't let them in and we look for them, but I see them all the time, collectors bringing them to me because they want to sell, mm -hmm. and we have to be the ones to reveal. Uh, you might want to what, what tips you off in, where you say, uh, no, this is not well, original? Well, experience with hand. I mean, I've handled hundreds of books of Mormon, mm -hmm. and this, there's going to be a something off about the printing quality or the paper or a book that's 150 to 200 years old, those pages have lived together for that long. So they acquire a patina and a stain pattern, mm -hmm. little imperfections from water and in the environment over the years. And if that's not consistent through the pages, it stands out to you. Or if it's not integral part of the signature that's been sewn into buying, if, it been, if it's been applied and put in, uh, a, a close examination reveals those things. It's how, it's, it, it's how it matches up with the rest of the pages in the book. And, and when you've done it enough, it becomes second nature. Hmm. It's like people bring in, you know, facsimile copies of everything from the Desert News to the Declaration of the Independence to what have you. And I 
I don't even need to, I can just to glance at them across the room and I know would no, you, no. that, sorry, they're not real. Mm -hmm. And people get mad because I haven't taken any time <laughs> with it, but I just know. Yeah. You are obviously running a business. What yeah. does it mean to your business to be in the heart of Mormonism? <sighs> That's a big question. I, I am not religious. I'm not LDS. I'm not a Mormon. On my dad's side of the family, I come from a long line of Mormons. My uh, great-great-grandfather translated the Book of Mormon into Maori. Wow. Which means, Bob, he was hanging out with the natives in New Zealand circa 1880-ish. Wow. That would have been a wild thing to have yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his sister, Ellen Sanders Kimball, a great aunt, she was uh, Heber C. Kimball's favorite polygamist wife, mm -hmm. and she was one of the three uh, pioneer women in the valley with the advance party in 1847. So I've got plenty of Mormon history, but I don't pretend to be LDS to sell LDS books. I, I, I'm not a good actor. I just have to be me. <laughs> and, but what does it mean to your business that you are here? Uh, we do a lot of business with rare LDS books, and by and large, a handful of institutions aside, it's individual LDS collectors. Very few non-LDS collectors are gonna, you know, pony out three figures for a, a Mormon rarity. And there are books far rarer than Books of Mormon. Books of Mormon are something we all understand and can relate to. We Around here we yeah, know it from yeah. the, the shiny blue paperbacks of my youth, yeah. which uh, <laughs> they were 50 cents then, 50 or cents five bucks yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, no big increase there. But to answer the other part of your question, <sighs> the internet and the availability of books, say from the 1990s to now, over the past 20 to 30 years, has been astonishing. So books that used to be bread and butter, books in the 50 to $500 range, the market for that has collapsed. The market for information books, dictionaries, encyclopedias, in the olden days, if you needed to research something about, you know, Abraham Lincoln or Joseph Smith or what have you, you had to have that original source book, so you had to shell out five grand. Now you can do a print on demand or un download it for nothing or yeah. very little money. So that need for the information, and it's great, I'm glad we have access at low cost or nothing. Uh, the digitization pro project, the University of Utah Marriott Library is digitizing every newspaper Mm -hmm. in the territory and state. Oh, Not wow. just the Salt Lake Tribune and the Desert News, but little weekly papers from southern Utah, uh, military, like the, the, uh, uh, Hillfield in Ogden. Mm -hmm. They published a whole in-house newspaper up there. They've just had a, a complete collection donated to them. They're digitizing that. And it's exciting for researchers and historians that you can go online and do that kind of um, research, research and, yeah. and history now, so I'm all for it, but it's changing our markets, and so a book that I had on the shelf for 50 bucks is now 10 bucks, and 500 bucks might be 50 bucks, and I'm not complaining, it's just the, I, to the survive, profile, the I have profile. to adapt of what a rare book is and how much it is worth has been changed by when the you, internet. Yes, when you can go online push a button 24 hours and get what you want, it changes the need and the psychology of how right. people buy books and why they buy them. What is the rarest book to have passed through your hands? Well, for me, that's pretty easy. And no big news flash here, it's a Mormon book. Hmm. Everybody knows about the Book of Mormon. Sure. The second book of LDS sacred scripture is called the, the Doctrine and Covenants. That was first published in 1835 as opposed to the Book of Mormon, 1830. Right. But in 1833, a precursor to the Doctrine and Covenants called the Book of Commandments yeah. was published in Ohio. Um, too long a story, but there was a lot of Mormon, anti-Mormon stuff going on, people burning things, presses to the ground, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, and I'm anti-Mormon, Bob, burns 
the book of commandments, the press, the type, out the window, sheets flying in the wind, the alleged Mormon girls that hid the sheets under their skirts, and the 29 known copies of the book of commandments today came from those sheets flying in the wind. Wow. One walked into my store 20 years ago. It was incomplete, like maybe most of them are, because they technically were never published. They, some of them got uh, bound bound by hand, you know, hand stitched and rawhide. Mine was 60% complete. And at the time it went for $200,000. Today, a book of commandments is a million, it's the first million dollar Mormon million book. Million dollars. Don't have one anymore. Would my incomplete one bring that? I'd probably not, mm. but that's the rarest book I've ever handled. And, it, it, and to answer a previous question of yours that I don't think I really addressed, um, what, do we, what do I look for? What, you know, what gets me excited? Well, the easy answer, is, and it's not about how many dollars it's worth, it's you wanna see something that you've never seen before or something you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. That's for me. I worked for Sam Wellers in late 60s, early 70s, the late Sam. Sam was a very good bookman. Uh, I knew things like comics, sci-fi, and illustrated books. He knew Mormons and Western Americana. And all of that. I knew more about my subjects than he did, even though I was a kid. And Sam yeah. would never have admitted that. <laughs> of course not. <clears throat> but he had and I knew it was good. I devoured the artist Maxfield Parrish. I just absolutely loved his books. Mm. And his very first book was also L. Frank Baum's very first book, Mother Goose in Prose. And it's uh, a takeoff on Baum wrote the Mother Goose text and Baum did 20, or Parrish, Maxfield Parrish did 20 black and white illustrations. This was a proof set, so it was some kind of advanced set. It was just the artwork, the 20 prints on tissue paper. Uh, I think they were numbered and signed in pencil by Maxwell Parrish, mm -hmm. and they were contained in a box that I believe was made out of redwood and had hand-tied strings to it. Wow. It was one of 27 copies. Wow. I had it in my hands. I knew it was gold. Sam wanted $100 for it. Now, he was paying me a buck an hour in those days. I wanted that. I knew it was gold. I knew I had something really, really special. But $100 was the moon. There's yeah. no way I could. Yeah, yeah. You I should well have just to walk put there. it on layaway and paid him a dollar <laughs> a month for every the rest week of my life. Yeah. That's what I should have done. Yeah, Instead, oh I sold it for him. You and I've never seen another. Well, I, I never have seen another copy. I saw a listing in a very prominent bookseller's catalog, mm -hmm. and this is some years ago now, and they won thirty thousand dollars for it. Oh wow! I knew it was gold. It wasn't worth thirty then, but I knew it was gold. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted it. I coveted it. You have been an appraiser on the Antiques Road Show yes. for a number of years. Yes, sir. Have you ever come across an item that you yourself wanted to buy or that you just sat there and just rolled your eyes and go, oh, you got to be kidding me? Well, first of all, uh, Antiques Road Show is a PBS uh, production. It's nonprofit. Right. All of us appraisers, like the many other volunteers we are volunteers for the show mm -hmm. and it's absolutely non-commercial uh, purchasing is absolutely forbidden we're not we are allowed to display our business card we're in the program the mm -hmm. guest can know who we are and if they we we other than their first names we don't know who they are mm -hmm. we're not allowed to and we're not allowed to conduct business so having said that well, of course there's been things I've coveted, and it's very, very rare that a guest contacts me after the show and actually, so much of it, it they're family heirlooms, they don't want to sell them anyway. Yeah. Yes, it's happened, not very often. The very first Salt Lake show I did was a cornucopia of treasures, because I 
it, they didn't have anybody that knew Utah Mormon material, and clearly, if you're going to come to Salt Lake City, you better you need, have that. They, yeah. they, they didn't the very first time. They've been here three times, yeah. and I wasn't with them the first time. But but a woman brought in a 19th century, probably 1870s, 80s trade catalog with beautiful chromolithographic plates, which just that was like the state of the art color printing. It just it's just color printing that just leaps off the page at you. It was a trade catalog for a glass manufacturer of bottles. Every page, and these were stiff pages with beautiful full color chromos of antique figural bottles. Oh, there were wow. bottles in every shape from animals to, I have in real life, and my late father was a big time antique bottle collector, I've never seen any of these bottles in real life, but they were there. They were there were bottles in the shapes of pistols, in the shapes of faces, in the sh every a, a boot, a lady's slipper. Uh, Incredible! I, I, I would have killed to be able to buy that, <laughs> that catalog, but I couldn't. Tell me about uh, in the Antiques Road Show. You were an appraiser on an episode when a lady brought in a very rare early LDS hymnal. Oh, yes. Talk us through that. Tell us what that was like to have that discovery there on that program. Um, well, collect, the LDS collectors, and even the public, maybe are more aware that of, of Book of Mormons, as we discussed. And the thing is, the three LDS scriptures, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Prize, Everyone understands their sacred scripture to the Mormon people. When your Book of Mormon gets a little tatty and the pages start coming loose, nobody throws them away. But the LDS hymnals that were published from the 1835 Emma Smith hymnal mm -hmm. to roughly 1850, there were about a dozen hymnals. They were designed, they printed up thousands of them, they used them, they got abused, they got torn apart and fell apart and they were trashed, yeah. unlike your scripture. So they're far rarer in general than LDS scripture are, especially the roughly dozen. There's the Rogers hymnal, there's the, yeah. the Ellsworth hymnal, there's the Emma Smith hymnal, and one of the rarest ones from the 1840s is the Bellows Falls, named after where it was printed. Right. Um, I think I've handled a sale of one once in my career, and that's actually what I based the appraisal price on, which was, I think, it was around fifty thousand dollars. Forty to fifty thousand okay. dollars. That little old lady had no idea what she had, <laughs> uh, and she was pretty excited about it. Yeah, incredible. What is the future of rare books? Look into your crystal ball and tell me 10 years, 15, 20 years from now, what will your industry and what will your vocation and avocation look like? I'm seeing, we've gone through this thing starting in the 70s with the chain stores like uh, B. Dalton that became Barnes and Noble and uh, um, the old uh, Walden books that's now gone. And, Barnes and Noble seems to be barely hanging on. They, they in their turn, decimated independent bookstores, and by the 80s, we were new bookstores were practically gone. Yeah. Um, the same thing now happens with Amazon and the used book trade and the internet. But what I'm seeing now, in just in the past year or two, print sales are now back on top of digital sales in the book world. Wow. Maybe it's kind of making a resurgence with young people like vinyl is. Yeah. Well, there's something when you ha tactile. Yes. When you have your, your senses, all of your senses being used, there's and, something to Including that. the decaying Holding book it. smell. Yes. That's very important. Yeah. No, it's those of us, we have to have the objects. I have to have them. Yeah. I mean, I like playing with them. I like sorting them. I, I like alphabetizing them and putting them in little tidy rows. You can't do rows. that like this. I mean, and, swiping on a And I love screen. reading the notes on the flaps and the dust jacket, yeah. just like I yeah. like reading the notes on the back. Uh, I collect LPs as well as books. Oh, do you really? I started in the 60s, and I never quit. <laughs> uh, they're out of control, for sure. 
Uh, I'm a vinyl junkie, Bob, I have to admit it to you. Well, confession is good <laughs> for the soul, Ken, so. <laughs> Well, Ken Sanders from Ken Sanders Rare Books in Salt Lake City, thank you so Bob, much for being part of Three Questions. It's my pleasure. It's nice to talk to you.